Bonnie was playing for us in number 369, Living for Jesus. Let's turn there, and if you would, stand with me, and we'll sing the first, the third, and the last in number 369, verses 1, 3, and 4. Living for Jesus, a life that <coughs> to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. Living for Jesus wherever I am, doing each duty in His holy name, willing to suffer affliction and loss each trial as part of my cross O oh, Jesus Lord and Savior I give myself to thee ere thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me I owe no other master my heart shall be thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of his smile. Seeking the lost ones, he died to redeem. The weary to find rest in him. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. In thine atonement, didst give myself for thee. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne, for to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Thank you. You may be seated as we get underway tonight. And before we get into our message, let me remind you, please, if I could, one thing that I failed to mention during our prayer time, and that is please be praying for the Olson family. Uh, they have the funeral for Doug's mom tomorrow up in Emmaus, so if you would be praying for them. I know family is traveling in for this funeral, uh, so please be in prayer uh, for them through all of this, and please continue to pray for Doug as the 30th. He has uh, surgery on his hip, uh, it'll have one of two outcomes depending on what they find. It can have a, a quicker recovery or a much longer one. If they go in and find the rod is able to come right out, it'll be the quicker recovery. If the rod does not move or come out, they're going to have to break the femur, which will add four to five weeks to that recovery time. Uh, so please be praying for him, no doubt. Uh, we want him to have the quicker recovery. He asked the doctor and said, so... You've been doing this for a long time, Doc, with all of this. What do you think? What are my chances? And the doc said, believe it or not, it's 50-50. Uh, so there's no understanding one way or the other what will come, but we do know that he'll have that surgery. So please be praying 
for them. We come back tonight to our scripture meditations. It is a wonderful blessing to consider, a remarkable thing to consider, that the God of heaven and earth took the time to record for us humanity his thoughts, that which we would need, and he preserved them then for every generation. He did so that we could come by and carefully now study to meditate upon these truths. And what a wonderful blessing it is that we can take such a small portion of Scripture at times and muse upon it to get as much from it as we can and allow the Spirit of God to teach us that we might completely understand and absorb the truth and make proper application. Tonight, our scripture meditation is taken from the book of Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Our title is simply this, let's go. So let go. We're going to understand the meaning of that in just a moment. If you would, let's back up to Hebrews chapter 5. I want to begin reading in verse 11. We're going to focus our thoughts really on verse 1 of chapter 6, but for sake of context, let's read the verses and then we'll bow together in a word of prayer. The author writes and says, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even though who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so he comes now, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, we ask and pray tonight that in the moments that we have to come to this simple verse of Scripture and to meditate upon its truth, that you would help us to see that there is a need for some things that we must let go so that we can go forward for you, for your honor, for your glory, for our greater benefit. And Father, we'll thank you for it. We ask and pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. As you and I begin to look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 tonight, I trust that you will understand with me the importance of such a text in light of the current climate within the church today. When I say the church today, I am speaking of the church universal. I'm not speaking here of our local church. We minister today in a generation where many claim to desire the deeper things of God, yet many have rejected the necessary truths of God's instruction while they seek to fulfill their life through their experiences, and they now have become the judge of God's truth based upon their experience. We now desire to have our own innovations in worship instead of following the instructions of God. Paul did tell Timothy that the day would come in 2 Timothy 4 that men would no longer endure sound doctrine, but they would instead heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. He had warned them that there's a need for us to put off these endless debates and these endless genealogies and these divisions which often come. And that men needed to now again come back and understand doctrine. So he even says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 in verse 2, That which I have committed unto you, please, Timothy, ensure that you commit that truth to other men so that they in turn can commit that to another generation and so on and so on and perpetually proclaim the truth of God's word. Today, again, we have a generation that does not truly care to follow the instruction 
of God. As you and I come to Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of this letter is dealing with this very concept. The book of Hebrews is a beautiful book that is really written to showcase for us the beauty of the person of Jesus Christ. But he is writing to a group of people that do need to let go so that they can go forward for God. He is dealing with those who have professed to believe in the truth of Jesus, yet they are being lured away by that which is old and familiar, the traditions of men. So really in this verse, the author gives a scathing rebuke and seeks to exhort them to a new and a better way. As we begin to look at the verse tonight, there is a context that you and I do need to consider as we come to chapter 6 and verse 1. And the reason that I know there's a context to consider is because of the way this verse begins. Look at the first verse. Therefore, I'm sure you've heard it said, but whenever you see the word therefore, you should ask, what is it there for? When you see that word, it's pointing you to a greater context. It's causing you to go back and consider what was just stated, what truth was just taught, in order that we might now make application to the truth that the author has now said. This word causes us to seek out context. The writer of Hebrews is exhorting his audience to complete a challenge based upon words of rebuke that he has just offered. And those words of rebuke are found in chapter 5, verse 11, down through verse 14. In order to understand that context, I want to back up just a little bit more and give you a little bit of what's taking place in all of the book of Hebrews. This overall letter was written to Jewish believers who are now facing great persecution because they have said, I believe in Jesus Christ. Because they have turned from Judaism and turned to the church, these Jews are facing great pressure by persecution. It is coming at this juncture of history from the Jewish community, and it is also coming upon them from the Roman society and the world at large as they are persecuting Christians. Many of them are beginning to question, is this move to the church worth it? Is this newfound quote-unquote religion, which by the way is not a religion, but a relationship, is this worth committing my life to knowing that these pressures, these difficulties will exist. And there were some who were turning away from their faith. And so the author writes to them to convince them that that which they are doing is because Jesus is better. Throughout the entirety of this book, the author writes a message to tell them that Jesus is better than anything that their former religion has to offer. And again, please understand what he's comparing it to, Judaism. It was the way that God had used to be able to bring about the wonderful truth that there was a Messiah coming. This wonderful religion that had within it the law given to Moses by God on the mount. There are some wonderful figures of human history in this religion of Judaism. And yet the author writes to say, but all of this was to point to one who is better. His name is Jesus. Jesus is better in the book of Hebrews than the prophets. That's what we are told in the first three verses. He is better than the angels beginning in verse 4 to the end. He then tells us he is better than Moses, their greatest of leaders, the emancipator of his people, the lawgiver. 
when you talk about Judaism, you have to talk about Aaron and the priesthood. And in chapter 7, he tells them Jesus is better than that whole system all the way through chapter 9 and the sacrificial system. Jesus Christ is better. Folks, I hope you believe that right now tonight. Because there are pressures today. Do we continue on? Isn't it just worth quitting, giving up all of the pressures, all of the struggles, the financial issues that we'll have to face, and, and the cost of doing ministry? Is it really worth it? Is it worth my family committing themselves to the church? Hear me. Jesus is better. You bring anything to me from this world, that what it has to offer. You bring anything to me from any other religion, and I can prove to you Jesus is better. He is. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is addressing in the entirety of this book. However, as he is doing that and encouraging them in all of these things, he also stops and he warns them. In fact, he stops and warns them several times, five different times he stops and he warns them. They are often referred to in your study of the book of Hebrews as parenthetical passages. In these warnings, we find a progressive truth that is laid out over and over to these who are considering turning away from that which is best and better, Jesus Christ. I want to point them out to you tonight, and I encourage you to go back. I don't have the time to lay all of this out. We will probably do that at some point while we study together the book of Hebrews, and we'll do it in some great detail. But let me give you the overview if I can. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the writer says, How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He says to them that there is a danger of drifting, that we loosen ourselves from the moorings of the Word of God, and we begin to drift. Drift away from what we have held to. Drift away from the truth. So much so that we get down the road somewhere, and we get to the point that we say, how did I get here? There's a danger of drifting. When we begin to drift, it leads to a danger of doubting. And so we are told in chapter 3 that we should exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest there become an evil heart of unbelief into your heart and into my heart. We begin to doubt the goodness of God. In chapter 5, in the verses that we read tonight, it speaks of a danger of dullness. When we should be able to be the ones who teach, we still need to be taught. We are spiritual babes. We are dull and need to be sharpened. With that dullness, it leads to a problem now that I am dull to the conviction of God because I've drifted and I've doubted. Chapter 10 speaks of the danger of deliberate sin. Folks, I want you to know something about these warnings. Each one is written to the believer. Okay, I don't have the time again to go into that and prove it to you. There are some commentators that believe that all of these parentheticals are written to those who profess but don't possess. I don't believe that's true because in every one of these passages, he is speaking to the believer and then speaks of these dangers, and it is possible for the believer to live a life of deliberate sin. And if we allow that to continue in our dullness, our doubting, and we continue to drift, we get to the place that we'll even willingly deny what we believe. These are the dangers. It is in the midst of all of these things that we read our verse, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. I believe that little phrase there, let us go on to perfection, is actually the key verse and the key theme to the entirety of the book of Hebrews. Let us go on unto perfection. Again, he is warning them, 
He strongly rebukes them because of their immaturity in Christ. He refers to them as babes in the word of God. Obviously, there is a time and a place for us to be spiritual babes, right? We sang tonight about that new name written down in glory. Remember that day? You had that date in mind? Remember what took place on that day that you were saved? At that moment, you were a spiritual babe, right? You were. That's where you should be. But you realize that the Bible says that you and I should be growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we should be growing to the place of maturity. There's something wrong with a child who does not develop properly physically. There is something wrong with a person who does not develop properly spiritually. If we are 10 and 15 and 20 years into our quote-unquote salvation, and still we are babies and we cannot handle meat, but have to have someone else provide us milk, there's a problem spiritually. That's what the author's writing of. And so he says, let's go. Let's go on unto perfection. That requires that we let go. So let's now consider this challenge to complete, because that's what verse 1 of chapter 6 is. After this very strong rebuke, those of you who should be teachers, shame on you. You can't handle the meat. And one who handles the meat is one who is able to exercise their senses so that they know good and evil. Can you handle the meat of the word? If not, here's what he's going to say to you and me. Let's go on unto perfection. As we look at this challenge to complete, in verse 1, we are told that there are two things that need to happen. Number one, there's a leaving and there's a going. I want to look at those concepts briefly with you tonight. Let's first of all talk about this concept of leaving. Here's what he says. In light of that challenge that he has given, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Let's talk about this word leave first. This word leave is a term. It means to put off. It means to place aside. It carries the idea of a separation, to leave behind something, okay? So in light of the challenge of those of you who are still babes who need to go on to perfection, he says, there is a need for you to leave behind, to set aside. Okay, the idea is that I set it aside in order to go on to another. Okay, that concept is used in 1 Corinthians 7 as it speaks about a man who is divorcing his wife to take on another. You leave behind because you want something else. That's the word that's being used here. We are to leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. We are to put off, place aside, leave behind, here's the phrase, the principles of the doctrines of Christ. And you might say, wait a minute, Pastor. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound like what a believer needs to do for spiritual maturity. Well, when we read it in our version, it is a different sound, and it is an unfortunate way that it's rendered. Most Greek scholars interpret the passage this way, the word of the beginning of Christ. You say, Pastor, what's that referred to? Well, the idea here is this. The principles of the doctrine of Christ 
speaks to the old covenant. Again, remember to whom he's writing. He's writing to Jewish believers. These who are considering going back to Judaism, where the principles of the doctrine of Christ existed, where the beginning of the word of God was found, where the beginnings the word of the beginning of Christ where he is instructed to us, but we don't fully know him as much. And so he's referring to the old covenant, the ways of Judaism. You say, Pastor, can you prove to me that that's what that means? Well, I think I can. Look at verse that's following after the word perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. In these verses, in that little section that I just read, there are six essentials listed, all of which are a reference to Judaism. Let me point to two of them tonight. The first one I want you to see with me when we talk about the Old Covenant is this word baptism. You and I think of baptism differently in the New Covenant than the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant, it refers to the ceremonial washings under the law. So when you would bring your offering, there was a ceremonial washing. There was washings of the Old Testament priests that they would have to go through. There was the washing of the Old Testament a high priest as he entered into the uh into the tabernacle once a year on the Day of Atonement. There were all of the washings, these things that they had to do. That's what it means here when he speaks of these baptisms. He's speaking of these ceremonial washings underneath the law. We don't find them in the New Testament. We don't find it in the New Covenant. But he says we need to leave these things behind. He speaks of the laying on of hands. You and I would think of the laying on the hands in the New Testament as when a, a man is ordained or met or, or a place under the service of even deacon and we gather people around, we commission a missionary, we send them out, and we have people gathered and we lay on hands. That's not what we're speaking of here. He's speaking here of a Jewish practice that when they would bring the sacrifice, the one bringing the sacrifice would place his hands on the head of the animal, symbolizing that his sins are being transferred to this animal who is now going to die in its place. Here's what he says. Leave behind this old system of the law. It's time for you to go on unto perfection. That's his plea. Leave behind your traditions. Leave behind this old religion. Embrace this new relationship with Christ, which was foreshadowed in the old that you now experience in the new. In fact, I like the way Dr. English put it in his commentary. He says, forget the shadow. The substance is here. Isn't the substance better than the shadow? I don't know about you, but a picture might be worth a thousand words, but it's a whole lot better to have whatever you're looking at right there in front of you. I can see pictures of McKinsey, but she's in Indianapolis. I'll see pictures of Ben when he leaves to go to Pensacola. I'll see pictures of Emma while she's at Maranatha. I will even hear her probably play the piano while she's in Wisconsin, but it's so much better for her to do it up there. And I told her she has to come back there. She's welcome to go away for a few years. She can get married and come right back, and she can be right back on the piano. Amen. You convince her of that, all right? Because that's what she needs to do. I wanted to obey her father in this one. But the substance is better than the shadow. Jesus Christ is better. And folks, maturity is better than immaturity. And there are so many people holding on to traditions and religion when what they could have is the person of Jesus Christ. The substance. So we are to leave, and then we are then to go on. Let's talk about this phrase for just a few moments. 
and only have a few minutes left. The word means to be carried. It means to be borne along. This verb, by the way, is a passive. That means that the subject is being acted upon. You and I are to be born along in our maturity. Who does that? That's the work of God. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. We are to be born along. Where are we heading? To perfection. That's the word maturity. One who is able to eat meat. One who can process his own food. Our maturity is not something we do on our own. It is something that we allow God to work in us and bear us along as we begin to learn and to grow and to understand as we spend time with Him, as we spend time in His Word. This is not a challenge for you and I to consider the author says, complete it. The problem is you're immature. You're a babe who still needs someone else to feed you and process truth for you. It's time for you to eat meat. Let God bring you to maturity. Let's go. So let go. Leave behind that which is keeping you from following the Lord. The author basically says this, enough is enough. You're in danger of falling away. You're in danger of denying the Lord as you drift from your moorings. You are beginning to doubt. Spiritually, you are dull. And if you're not careful, you will live even deliberately in sin that you will walk away from this wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. Folks, don't be fooled. This is happening far too often in the realm of the church today. I believe there are many young people who were saved in their childhood, their parents brought them to church. They heard the Sunday school stories. They talked with mom and dad. They were convinced that they needed to be saved. They went to the mom and dad, and in childlike faith, they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They were saved. But then as they began to grow, they kind of stalled in their own spiritual growth. They begin to doubt. They begin to drift. They become dull. They continue to go to church, but they don't really pay attention. They're there, but they're not connected. They're not really listening. They're too busy doodling, texting, looking on Facebook, doing everything else that they really don't need to do, playing games on their phone, whatever it might be in this generation. Then they begin to make some deliberate choices, and they sin. And then they get to about 18, 19 years of age, and they've graduated from their Christian school. They don't have to go back to church because I'm an adult now, and they never darken the doors of a church again. And that happens over and over and over again. Let's go. Let's not allow that to happen anymore. Mom and dad, determine within your heart that's not going to happen to your children. Let's as a church determine that's not going to happen here through our ministries at Open Door Baptist Church and even Lebanon Christian Academy. Let's go. It's time to go on to maturity. You know what that means? It's time for us to let some things go. The church today is infighting. The church today is bogged down with endless genealogies and endless debates. We argue with one another and accomplish absolutely nothing. And our children are paying the price. I see it in the lives of adults and children alike. Here's what the author says. It's time. It's time to go on to perfection, maturity. Let go. Follow Christ. He is better than what you're holding on to. If you don't, there are dangers. As you drift, you will doubt. You'll become dull. You'll deliberately sin, and you will deny. 
That's the warning. Heed it because it's come true for too many. Father, we ask and pray your blessing upon us as we go tonight. Lord, we recognize that of all of our scripture meditations, this may be one of the ones that's a little heavier, a little bit more geared to challenge, but Lord, it's a necessary one for everyone sitting here tonight, for our entire church. There is a sad reality within the church of Jesus Christ today that many have failed to reach the place of spiritual maturity. They are still in need of someone else teaching them when they themselves should be able to teach. So Lord, we ask and pray that you would cause us to let go so that we can go forward for our Savior to the place of maturity that you have designed for us. We thank you, Lord, for it. Bless us as we go tonight. Give us a good remainder of this week. I do ask and pray that you view the old sins tomorrow as uh, they will gather together as a family, as they celebrate uh, Doug's mom's life, yet they also do sadly have to say goodbye. And Lord, I pray that you give grace. I pray that you would give peace. And may it be a prosperous day. And may you even give to Doug and Kathy the opportunity to be a witness and a help to some of their family who are not walking in the way that they should, some who are living in sin. So Lord, I pray that you would cause them to have boldness tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you would be with Doug, especially because we know he struggles with pain within his hip. We ask that this surgery to come would correct that quickly. And Father, we pray that it would be the simplest of solutions when that day comes. So Lord, again, we commit this night to you. Bless our teachers as they continue to prepare for a new year. Bless our back-to-school night on Sunday afternoon at 4. We pray, Father, that you would cause us all to come back and be able to minister to those in need who come. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. You are dismissed.